This podcast is presented by RMG, empowering your business with AI-powered global workforce. Imagine a world where every customer interaction becomes an opportunity to shine, where your business effortlessly outperforms competitors. At RMG, we make it possible. Our virtual assistant and contact center services empower your business not just for today, but throughout your transformation journey. Experience the RMG advantage today. Welcome to the Rainmakers podcast, where we dive into the stories of passionate professionals who dared to dream, persisted through the storm, and turned their visions into reality. In each episode, we'll present the narratives of modern day Rainmakers. Whether you're in corporate leadership, a seasoned entrepreneur, or just starting out, this podcast is your source of motivation, valuable insights, and the belief that chasing your dreams can indeed lead to sunny days. But before we plunge into today's inspiring story, we would like to take a moment to mention our presenter, RMG. Helping you shine by handling tasks that free up your time so you can focus on career and business growth. And what truly matters to you? More about them later in the show. Welcome to the Rainmakers Podcast. I'm your host, Rain Rose, here to share stories of those who inspire me and may inspire you too. This is the Rainmakers Podcast. In a field where compassion meets innovation and disparities persist, Conwell Hawk stands as a beacon of hope and change. Her journey in advancing women's health is not just remarkable, but also a testament to the power of resilience and dedication. Beyond her impressive titles and accolades, Conwell has shown that being a rainmaker isn't reserved for a select few. It's a role anyone can embrace. Through her visionary leadership, impactful advocacy, and dedication to empowering others, Canwell has stitched her influence into the fabric of success, inspiring countless individuals on her path. Welcome, Canwell. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. And always happy to do this with my co-host and dear friend, Shannon Yang, a true rainmaker, celebrated for her sharp insight and heartfelt dedication to lifting others. Shannon consistently brings a unique blend of warmth and expertise to our discussion. Thanks always, my friend. So happy to be here again, Rain. Thank you for inviting. Thank you. So ladies, let's make it rain. Canva, um, I've actually perused your LinkedIn profile. So I guess my first question is, how does your work in medical anthropology, community-based research, and women's health intersect to improve women's health? Yeah, um, so really, you know, community-based research, I didn't really know what it was called. Um, I, I realized that it was something that I was naturally doing because I'm very invested in like the community that I live in and kind of how do I make the world around me better and really like that starts with the community right around me um and so I think at a young age I was always organizing if there was you know something happened in my community um like I grew up in rural Missouri and so I remember in sixth grade there was a tornado that happened so after the tornado I like organized folks to do like a clothing drive um, to take clothes um, that had been destroyed help wash them basically like just always kind of organizing my friends um, and my local community members in terms of like how we could help others in our community Um, and so I didn't know that there was a word for it it was just something I naturally felt drawn to do Um, and then once I got to college I knew that I wanted to do something in medicine it wasn't sure what Um, and so I read this book called Mountains Beyond Mountains and it was about Dr. Paul Farmer who was a infectious disease physician and a medical anthropologist Um, and in that book there was a line and it said the idea that some lives matter less than others is the root of all that's wrong with the world and for me like a light bulb went off I was like this is this is what I'm trying to articulate and I didn't have those words before but then I finally felt I had the words to communicate like how I felt about the world and that I you know what equity really looked like and meant to me um and so that was kind of when I decided I was going to become a medical anthropologist I really didn't know what it meant besides just what I had read in the book um and I knew that he had done some work in Rwanda Um, And so I actually extended graduating college by a year so that I could go and study abroad in Rwanda and see some of the work that he had done and learn what community-based research really looks like in action, right? And so like what it is is that you're working with the community 
Like you don't go in and say like, hey, this is an issue that I heard you guys have. It's really about coming in and saying, hey, what, how can I support you? What are some challenges the community is facing and what, you know, what would you like to see change? Um, and so that's really, I would say, like the essence of what is community based research. So it can look like so many different things. Um, but my focus just happens to be health. Um, and I think for me, that's because, you know, I grew up with a mom who has a rare autoimmune condition in rural Missouri, seeing her you know, not being able to get the care that she needed all of the time, having to drive several hours um, to different appointments. I think just seeing that was really impactful in like my own upbringing and kind of pulled me towards health. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's where all of these things sort of intersected and one thing led to another. Um, and I kind of found, you know, the space that I was really happy in, which is really doing community-based research that focuses on women, focuses on the lives of women around me, and how can I help them, um, you know, and help uplift them so that they can achieve their goals. And for me, that usually means their health goals. Would you say that there's been an improvement from then to now? I mean, if, if you account you know, your experience, you said your, your mother, has there been an, an improvement then to now? Um, so I would have hoped so, but I don't know, right? I think we've improved definitely in the amount of science we have, the direction of medicine, but some of the really scary things that I found out while writing and researching for this book was that, you know, in the United States, women were not included in clinical trials until about 30 years ago. Um, that means that most of what's on the market, most treatments, most medications, they are not designed for women. Um, and this is why, you know, I would assume 80% of medications that are taken off the market, it's because they have adverse side effects in women. Um, and so I was really shocked when I found this out. And I was shocked when I found out, like, even today, research studies are not required to report their analysis by sex. Um, and so, you know, as we're moving forward in the world of like health and medicine, we're talking about personalized medicine, precision medicine, right? But how can we do that if we haven't really studied women and we haven't designed healthcare for women? Um, and so that's really what I want to create like more awareness about because I think I was working um, in the healthcare space. I trained in this, I studied this, and I still didn't know a lot of this information. And it was actually not until I got sick myself, you know, that I thought things were going to be a lot better than they were for my mom, but I was still hitting my head against a wall trying to get care. Um, and so that's really like what led to this book. Ultimately, this book is um, not just my project, but the love and labor of over a hundred women, physicians and health experts from all across the country who really care about women's health and who really care about uplifting women and giving them the tools that they need to better take care of themselves and also teach them how to advocate for themselves um, in health and healthcare settings. So the, you know, the, when it comes to taking care of oneself, there are two um, perspectives, I think. One is mentally, right? Uh, mentally and psycholog psychologically. And one is the physical wise. So does this book cover both sides or is it more um, like weighted towards one? Yeah, it's definitely, we definitely have a holistic approach. Um, and so um, mental health is covered in terms of like, we cover depression, we cover um, anxiety in terms of like the more clinical disorders. But I guess I can give you a little bit of background of like how this book is structured. You can see it's pretty large um, and it can feel a little intimidating, 500 plus pages, but really it's very easy to use. You don't need to read all 500 pages. And we kind of divided the book into different sections so that you can use the section or a specific chapter as you need it. So the first section is kind of um, the landscape of women's health, right? So there we thought about what really is women's health? What usually comes to mind when we think about women's health? Usually we think about things like breast cancer or, you know, pregnancy or menopause. We 
what we like to say the boobs and tubes type issues, right? And so those are really important mm -hmm. when it comes to women's health. But then we say bikini and beyond, right? So there's also so many other things um, outside of bikini medicine is referring to essentially, you know, like when you're wearing a bikini, your boobs and your vaginal area are covered. Um, and so beyond that, right? Like what is impacting women's health? So in that first section, um, we kind of set the landscape. We thought a little bit about how would women right now access health information. So there's like a chapter called is Google your first responder. So if you're going on the internet and you're looking for health information, what should you do with that? Um, you know, how do you validate it? How do you have a conversation about what you researched and found with your doctor? There's um, a chapter on, you know, should you go to the ER? Or should you go to urgent care? What are the differences? Um, and how to find the right doctor for you. Telemedicine, sort of these more general things are in that first section. And then the second section covers 55 different clinical conditions. Um, and we, you know, we wanted to cover like over a hundred, but um, hopefully there's a part two. So in the 55, we cover, like you were asking, um, we cover both things that might, you know, be more mental health related or physical health. Um, I think it's all part of health. So we have um, depression, we have anxiety, we have painful sex, we have heart disease, we have migraines, we have PCOS, we have endometriosis. There's 55 different conditions there and they're all templated so that you can just turn to whatever chapter it is right so like let's say it's the painful sex chapter you turn to that chapter it's going to be written exactly the same way like the one on migraines is written so it's going to explain what is painful sex can it be prevented how is it treated why does it matter to women right so if research has or hasn't been done there um questions to ask your healthcare team and then pearls of wisdom from an expert. And so those questions were written with someone who treats painful sex, someone, you know, whose specialty this is. And then the pearls of wisdom are, you know, sometimes it's more educational, sometimes it's motivational, um, depending on kind of what that specialist wanted to really, you know, we asked them like, if you had all the time in the world, what is that nugget of advice that you would want every woman to know? And so that's what's in that Pearls of Wisdom section. At Sam & Co, we believe the joy of the best things. That's why we offer a wide selection of pet essentials and supplies. From treats, leashes, toys, and pet costumes, to almost everything. Sam & Co is a one-stop shop for you and your pets. Enjoy free shipping on orders $49 or more. Shop Salmon Co. Pits now for wagging tails and more. Um, and then the third piece is called taking care of you. And that's more things like, you know, we hear all the time, like, you got to eat right. You got to sleep right. Um, what does that really mean? At least to me, it wasn't intuitive because I'm like, there's so much information out there. How can I you know, what's the bare bones that I should know. But then on top of that, how do things like uh, relationships impact our health, mindfulness, acupuncture, um, you know, uh, purposeful activity, so hobbies, how do all of these things impact our health and well-being? So really, um, you know, long-winded answer, but we're very holistic in our approach and we wish it was even, you know, we covered a hundred more things, but um, yeah, that's really the approach that we took. What chapters from taking care of you are, are you most proud of? Yeah, um, I think overall, I'm very proud of just the whole book and all of the women who took, you know, time and love that they poured into this. Um, some of the chapters that really, I think I'm probably most proud of, um, the one that really stands out is you're a health promoter. And I think kind of, um, as you were saying earlier about being a rainmaker, we talk about health promotion as in everyone can be a health promoter, right? We can all do small things every day to better our health and to help our loved ones, our friends, our family members, right? So that could be something like if you're taking a meeting and instead of sitting down, you take it walking, right? Like while you're on the phone, or it could be like, 
you're meeting up with some of your girlfriends and you decide like, oh, you know, we're going to have something healthy today instead, or we're going to go do like a physical activity together, you know? Um, so there's lots of different ways that we can incorporate, you know, like these nuggets of health um, into our everyday life. And um, I think what's really exciting about that is that once you start doing that slowly over time, you realize like, hey, this feels good and I've made real changes. Um, and then it doesn't feel like health is like this big burden where we have to, you know, uplift and change our entire lifestyle because that's not feasible and, you know, nobody wants to do that. <laughs> it really has to come from within, I guess, you know, step by step, right? Little by little. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So yeah. Uh, so, um, your book covers over 50 common conditions affecting women. How did you in ensure it's inclusive and accessible to all? Yeah, so we really, you know, um, like I was saying earlier, we had an original list, I want to say of like 105 conditions. But then we really narrowed it down based on what is most common, um, like what women would want to know about the most, right? So we looked at what's killing women in the United States today. You know, it's not the um, most uplifting thing to talk about, but the thing is that like, we have to know something's a problem before we can change it, right? So the things that are killing women in the United States today, those are things like heart disease, diabetes, stroke, dementia, right? Um, and so we, that's kind of how we narrowed things down based on, you know, what are the biggest problems that are that women are facing right now? And then, you know, how can we help them learn about these issues and advocate for themselves if they're experiencing some of these issues? So that's that was our approach in terms of making this more accessible and more equitable. Um, but, you know, we would love to cover every condition and um, part of what we're working on now is, you know, providing more resources. So like if we didn't cover that condition, you know, where is a place that you could go online? How could you have a conversation with your doctor about it? So we provide some of those tools because, you know, we, we weren't able to cover every single thing. But how can we, you know, route folks in the right direction? So um, what is the most um, difficult thing that you had to do in order to put this whole book together because you know it's I'm sure a book like this is different from um, you know you writing a book on your own this is like um, many people's effort so did you find it was challenging to um, get people to start talking about it or are everybody just very passionate about this and you had no problem of gathering everyone but even that you know you still have to go out there and talk to every single expert so I would like to hear, like, yeah. in this process, what, what was the most challenging and memorable experience you've had? Yeah, so I would say, you know, I definitely could not have done this without my co-author, Dr. Mary O'Connor, or our illustrator, Margot Sarkozy. And I think that was kind of our core team. So, like, we had this three-person team that was always kind of working together in sync, talking every day. And we all wrote this book um, outside of work. We all have our, you know, nine to five jobs, um, other commitments. Margot is a student. Um, and so we worked on this in the evenings and on the weekends. And I would say, you know, um, what was challenging but was also exciting was that we did get to meet so many different experts because we reached out to women and overall the responses were very you know people were excited they wanted to create this they wanted to contribute to women's health in this way um i think what was harder was really kind of getting to the root of this issue um really writing for the lay person and communicating that medical jargon the the mumbo jumbo in a way that every woman could understand it right so that you didn't feel like you need a medical degree and that you're looking up every other term to try to figure out what is this thing we we and um i think that was a harder part because physicians are so used to speaking in you know their language and their medical terminology and so it was like we would write they would write it and we'd be like all right like we got to go back we got to edit this again Let's go back again. Nope, I'm still not understanding these terms. I would say that was probably the most difficult part. 
But I think that whole process probably made every woman who contributed to this book a better physician and a better like health educator in this process. I actually um, saw in one of your interviews as well, it was mentioned that 80% of medications are withdrawn due to their effects in women. Can you explain this further and its impact in women's health? Absolutely. So I think this is a really kind of harrowing statistic. Um, and I can send out some articles on it afterwards. But, you know, I think part of this, why this is happening is because that research hasn't been done on women, right? So like when they're, they're testing different drugs or different treatments, they are not testing it um, you know, on men and women, um, and then reporting, okay, this is what we saw in men, this is what we saw in women, because that's not required to report it in that way. There is a policy that came to be in 2016 that encourages folks to do that, but it's not a law, it's not required, right? And so that's why I think we're seeing this, right? Because like unless we are very diligent and i also understand right because in the scientific community there was a step back that was taken because um like if a woman is pregnant or she's trying to get pregnant and then she's you know part of research trials that could impact the mom that could impact the baby but the other side to that coin is that you know Women are not trying to get pregnant all the time. They're not pregnant all the time. Um, and I think women want to know and they want to have treatments and medications that are designed for them, that are safe for them, that they don't feel like every time they take something, they're like, eh, am I going to be okay? How is this going to impact my body, right? Like, I like I would want to know, is this, have you tested this on women? How many women? What has the response been like? Is there anything I should be aware of? Um, and I think that's how we move forward. So you also explain the 1 million more women campaign and your role in it. Yeah, so 1 million more, you know, this, this book, I would say was the, the start of what we want to do to transform women's health in this country, and then, you know, eventually around the world. But Really, the One Million More campaign, we're inviting every woman, you know, from ages 18 to 100 to participate in this. And really, we want to hear your your stories, right, of like, what have your healthcare experiences been like? Have there been things that you wish would have been better? Um, are there things that you think need to change? We want to hear from women, like, about their experiences and their ideas for change, because I think that's the one thing, like, I feel medicine and healthcare has not listened to women enough. And so we're really creating this campaign so women have that space to share their stories, to share their ideas, and that you know we can build something that is built by women for women, right? So our goal is you know in a year or so to build, first start by building a digital community for women where they can support each other. So if you're, ha you know, let's say you're going through depression or you're going through, you had a heart attack and you're going through recovery. So you can join in this type of support group. You're not, you know, having to look all over the internet for support groups um, and that, you know, you can of course have the support group if like the hospital offers it or the clinical clinic offers it. But then across the country, like having this broad, you know, community of women, um, who can support you and you know whether it's sometimes being like hey um where did you go to do x y or z or hey like i'm not feeling great right now and i really just need some support some uplifting to keep going on this journey um and that's really kind of the first piece and ultimately we would love to build a center for women that's focused on two different things so it's focused on kind of the public health piece creating you know the education the tools the programming that women need and then the second piece would be providing the medical care so that would be the place that you go to get 
care from the best experts from across the country. Um, and that's really, you know, our long term goal. We want to we want to create something that is really built with women in mind. And um, its sole focus is women and caring for women. Really impressive. Thank you so much, Kanwa. I'm not sure if it's a long question, but um, I feel like um, in order to lead to right now, like, you know, when you start writing a book and start sharing this, you must have some personal stories um, that in your life that inspired you to do something like this. And earlier you mentioned about your mom, right? Um, so tell me a little bit more about yourself, like your background. I think we probably are all very eager to learn at this point after hearing all that you know, all that inspiring talk. Sure. Yeah. So I, um, you know, I think for me, I, I come from an immigrant family. My parents immigrated to this country and um, actually my grandparents immigrated and my mom was in high school when she came. Um, and so part of that is right. Like there's an additional experience of like being an immigrant woman, being in a completely new country, trying to navigate this new healthcare system and then moving to rural America, right? Um, where it was very different and there's not as many resources. Um, and I think there have been um, a lot of personal stories. I would say, you know, I lost my grandmother. I feel like we lost her way too soon. Um, she died from lung cancer and she never smoked a day in her life. And so I'm like, how could she die from lung cancer? And then as I was researching this book, I found out, you know, lung cancer is one of the leading causes of cancer in women um, and women? one of the leading I'm causes sorry. of death. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Right. So like we wouldn't, I would have assumed like, oh, breast cancer is much higher, but lung cancer is, is a is a is one of the top killers um and you know i when i personally was going through my own health issues and i was kind of beating my head against the wall trying to get care not being taken seriously kind of being told like oh you're young you're healthy you're fine nothing is wrong and it's like i was passing out from pain um it was very, you know, at times very embarrassing, like couldn't control my bowel movements and passing out in public. And I was like, this is not okay. And every time I go to the doctor, they're just very dismissive. Um, and I think that probably really just, that was kind of the breaking point for me. Cause I was like, if I'm, you know, working in the healthcare space, I'm doing research in this space and I still can't get folks to listen to me. We have the best virtual assistants. RMG's virtual assistants are AI-powered and trained with the latest technology stack to elevate your business. Delegate all mundane, repetitive functions that can free up your time, such as lead generation, outbound calling, the data entry, social media marketing, and more. There are no startup fees and no annual contracts. Click the link below to get started. Like when I need care, what does every other woman do? Um... And so that's really, you know, like my personal mission in writing this book, because I wanted to create a tool that would literally be in the hands of every woman. So whether it's the physical book or the Kindle on your phone that you could turn to. So when you're in that doctor's office, you can ask you know, informed questions, you can ask, you know, you can advocate for yourselves. And if you're not being listened to, there's so many wonderful doctors out there that will listen to you, right. And I think that's another thing. Sometimes we, in this country tend to think um, of like, if we go to the doctors, we have to just listen to what they say. And that's it. We don't really ask questions, right. um, kind of take it. And like, at least for me, I was walking out of there being like, I have no idea what they just said to me. Like I, first of all, I was scared. I was anxious when I was in there. I couldn't fully listen. And then they were using this, all of this language that I couldn't process at the time. Um, and so, and then afterwards I would be, I would just leave feeling like I really didn't get what I needed out of that. Um, and I think now my, I have like a great team of different clinicians, but like I've also learned firsthand the difference between like what is good care and what is not so great care because I have these amazing physicians who, you know, will ask me questions, who will um, sit there with me that will listen to what I'm saying. If I say like, oh, I read this research article, 
they're like, oh, tell me where you found it. Like, let's see, you know, um, and I think there's, there's um, just like any other business, healthcare is a business. And if you feel like you're not satisfied with what you're getting, you can take your business elsewhere. <laughs> um, I know that's sometimes a little bit hard with insurance, but we we do have choice um, and we do have agency. And I think that's really what I want women to remember that like, you are the person that knows your body best. You are the person that can take care of yourself the best. And, you know, trust your gut. Um, if you think something is wrong, something's probably wrong. And um, go and seek care. Don't sit on it. Don't wait. And, you know, don't gaslight yourself because we tend to do that too. We tend to be like, oh, it's okay. You know, I'll just ignore it. I'll be fine. Da, da, da. And then, you know, it turns into a much bigger problem than it should have. And, sure. um, yeah, I think I like think for us that point. are not medically inclined, right? We tend yeah. to just take it. We don't ask yeah. questions. I even thought it's impolite to ask questions, right? So this this is really impactful for me personally. Yeah, well, to me too, because I am the type of person who just feel like, oh, something is wrong. Okay, I'm going to try to fix myself. I will never, I'm scared to go into the doctor's office. I'm like, I don't want to hear anything I don't want to hear, right? But this might be yeah. the first step you need to take if you really want to take control take your own health in your control. Yeah. And I think that's also why like building a community of women is so important because like what you're saying, I'm like, I felt both of those things. Like, I don't want to go to the doctor. I'm also scared. I'm also, I don't want to come off rude. You know, I don't want to come off abrasive. Um, but at the same time, like I need to get the care that I need. Right. And like, we can ask questions. We ask questions all the time. We ask questions on this call where it wasn't rude. It was actually, I was like, you know, um, it felt nice that someone was asking me about my work. And I think there's a way for us to do that and be more engaged um, and also feel like we have power over our own health. And, you know, even if something might be a little scary, like how we can work on it rather than it turn into something that is very scary. And, um, you know, prevention, prevention, prevention is key. And that's a lot of what we talk about here as well um, of like what we can do to prevent things. That's why we kind of start with like, what's the condition and how to prevent it before treating it? Because prevention is always easier than treatment. Thank you so much for sharing this with us and educating us. If you enjoyed today's episode and found it valuable, please don't forget to download, subscribe and share it with your friends and colleagues. As we come to the end of our discussion, I'd like to emphasize a powerful sentiment echoed by Kanwal throughout our conversation. She eloquently demonstrated that being a rainmaker extends far beyond individual achievements. It's about fostering a landscape of empowerment and equity in women's health. Let Kenwell's strong commitment inspire us to spread positivity in everything we do, ensuring a future where every um, woman's health and happiness are valued and honored. Thank you all for being a part of the Rainmakers podcast. A reminder that rainmakers are not passive spectators of the rainfall. They are the architects of change. Until next time, keep making your own waves, inspiring others, and forging your own path to success. Every day is a chance to make it rain.